Our scripture reading this morning is found in the book of Hebrews. It's chapter 11, verses 32 through 40. Um, would you, it's on page 975, by the way, if you're following along in your pew Bibles. Would you please stand if you are able and join me in the reading of God's holy word. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle, and rooted, for, and rooted foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released to what they might gain, an even better uh, resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes and in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. As soon as sin entered the world, God's people were given a shot clock. We're all living on borrowed time. As the sand drops in the hourglass, we have an opportunity to persevere and seek God's kingdom first in this life. Hebrews 11 tells of Abraham, Sarah, Moses, Noah, Rahab, and more. These men and women who served as imperfect ambassadors, longing to see the coming of the Messiah. They wrestled with sin, yet pushed back the darkness. In this sin-stained land, they were foreigners and strangers. Good morning, CRC. Good morning. Uh, I'm John, and it's an honor to serve God's church have you ever wondered why some have experienced miracles or the miracle, right? The miracle of, as we've been praying for um, in the North Carolina and Appalachia, all over where people have been devastated. Some, I'm sure, have felt as if, man, they've received a miracle. Someone found them. They, they, they received what was needed in their time of desperation. But have you ever wondered why some haven't, right? There are still some today in those areas that are waiting, that are destitute, that are, that are desperate. Maybe you know someone who had God show up in the 11th hour in a desperate time of crisis. I think a natural response can be, why haven't I or someone I loved experienced the miracle or a miracle in a time of need? And oftentimes we can begin, if you're anything like myself, to overanalyze why that might be. Why haven't I received the, the miracle that I needed in my time of desperation? And oftentimes that overanalyzation will take us to some pretty dark places, right? We'll start to think, do I have enough faith? Maybe the reason why I'm not experiencing it is because I just don't have enough faith. Or maybe I just haven't prayed enough. Or maybe... This is God's way of getting me back for that particular thing I did or that season in my life that was just evil and wrong. And so God's not hearing me or answering the way in which I would hope he would answer because of, because of that season or that thing. As we come to the end of Hebrews 11 here, uh, we really hear about two groups of people right, that Hebrews 11 kind of outlines, but the author here says, we don't have the time to talk about everyone. We don't have the space to, to talk about everyone. And so the two groups of people, the author seems to clump up into two buckets is one group who received the miracle, 
right? They, they, they prayed and God said yes to that. And so we see this where, where they slept soundly in a den of lions, where they were in a fiery furnace and they came out not even smelling like smoke or they went up against armies 100 times the size and they came out victorious. God moved and said yes to the miracle they were looking for. But and then we read of another group in Hebrews 11. Group two, people, believers, faithful people who found themselves in similar situations and probably asked God for the same miracle, but for them the answer was no or at least not yet. There's a better resurrection coming. There's a better miracle coming. They showed their faith not by living on the mountaintop of an answer and miracle, but rather by saying God is still worthy in the midst of unimaginable pain unimaginable persecution for the faith. And for the record, I, I think all of us wanna be in group one, right? And I want the miracle, I wanna experience that, I wanna, I, I wanna be able to pray and know, God, you, you're here. I wanna be on the mountaintop of that miracle, right? But the writer of Hebrews seems to be suggesting suggesting there's a far greater point than that. The, the question is not, what group do you wanna be in? I think that's assumed. But I would argue the question would be something like this that the author is posing or that the text imposes on us. Regardless of your lot in life, will your resolve be to live by faith? Regardless of your lot in life, regardless if the miracle comes that you're searching for, or if the circumstances in your life play out as you envision them playing out, and by the way, they're not going to, most likely. Regardless of that, roses and dandelions and flowers and God just wisping you away in this life for 98 years, beautiful health, 2.5 kids, white picket fence, swing on the front porch. This is Western Michigan, back porch. You see, regardless of what group they were in. The group on the mountaintop of an answered prayer for a miracle or the group in the valley of persecution to the point of death, their faith, verse 39 says in Hebrews chapter 11, it says they were all commended for their faith. They were all commended. Their abiding confidence in a God they could not see but were deeply in relationship with is the reason why they were commended for their faith. And hear me out, you might already be thinking, I'm doomed, right? God must have preordained this in his infinite wisdom for me to just be in group two. Maybe, maybe not. I would say no to that. And so in that response, you can often think, maybe I should just stop praying for the miracle. Maybe I should just give up. And for many of you, uh, I wanna bring this down to what, what I think a lot of us are praying for in our circumstances and situations in life. The miracle for you right now could probably be, I'm praying for a loved one who doesn't know Christ. And I've been praying for some of you decades and decades and decades, faithfully praying, been fasting, been believing, been reaching out, and I still see no life or no hope in that prayer. And so the temptation can be just to think, there's no point in continuing to pray. If that is you today, first I would beg you, please don't stop. 
Look at the parable of the persistent widow who just every day would go to the king's gates and he was an unruly king, an unjust king, Jesus shares of. And after a while, just said, man, just answer this woman's request. Jesus' point is very clear, I believe, in the parable. If an unruly, unjust king, after a while of persistence, would answer, how much more faithful is your God and kind is your God to answer as well. So do not stop giving up and praying. But also, I want to remind you of something else. If you feel like, well, I've never experienced a miracle. I've never seen it. Friend, your salvation is a miracle. The very fact today you are in, is this West or East Randall Street? Whatever. You're on Randall Street here at Coopersville Reformed Church. And you are worshiping God. And you are in a community of believers. And you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And you are sealed with the Holy Spirit, Paul says, inspired by the Holy Spirit in Ephesians. And you have the power through this resurrection power that lives within you to overcome temptation. The fact that that is all very much a reality in your life, friend, that is a miracle. And I would say that is the greater miracle than the health and the everything else that we pray for, which is so significant that I do not want to under, I do not want to underplay that. It's a very real thing. But friend, you are a living miracle if you're a believer in Jesus Christ today. So back to group one, we've witnessed the miracles group, and group two, for whatever reason, God said, no, we're not yet. I feel like when we're in group one and we've received the miracle, our response on the mountaintop is, God is wonderful, right? God is wonderful. Look at God. Look at what he did. That's a beautiful response. But oftentimes, as I've been able to walk with people through life, praying for a miracle, praying for a miracle, and then we get to know or not yet, and it's hard, and it's heavy. Oftentimes, I have heard their response in the midst of such affliction and tragedy and pain to be not necessarily God is wonderful, which they would still believe that, but it's more God is worth it. God is worth it. So whether you're in the God is wonderful group, maybe you're living in a season right now where you've experienced the miracle, you're on the mountaintop, God is wonderful, or maybe you're in the valley and you've experienced maybe not long ago, the God is worth it group, and that has been your abiding resolve. I heard two stories within a I think it was like 14 hour time frame. Actually, it was 12 hour time frame or so. On Monday, Monday morning, um, well, first Monday night, and then we'll go back. Monday night, I have a friend in our group. Um, started our small group Monday night. We're going through practicing the way, and it, it's, it was just a great start to the a great start to the week. And he shared a story that his sister was recently diagnosed with ALS in 2022. You said I could share this. And in the midst of her battle with ALS, he shared that his sister has an incredible joy despite the diagnosis. And he actually says, like, she's the most joyful person I've ever been around in this season. He goes, it's, it's unreal, John, how, how full of joy this sister of mine is. He goes, I leave being with her grieved in my own spirit that I don't possess this type of joy. Like I wanna be more joyful. And she's going through unimaginable pain. He said, the statement that she's been saying over and over is to other people, every day is the best day of the rest of my life. Every day is the best day of the rest of my life. And through her diagnosis, he shared, and she has led people to Christ 
left and right. People in our family are now like coming to Jesus. Like it's unbelievable. And then earlier that day, I, I go into the SALT group, our senior adult group, and they didn't check my ID. And uh, so I, I got in um, and I heard about a woman, uh, well, I heard about a man, but from a woman who, who was recently found to have two large tumors on his brain. And it was found to be a fast growing cancer. And the man had at least one son who did not know Jesus, and he had been praying for decades for this son of his. And so the, the, the lady who was sharing this story, and she said that, I can share it this morning, she, she invited them to her lake house because we didn't know if it was gonna be days or weeks for this guy. So hey, let's go to the lake house, get you on a boat ride, we'll help you get in the boat. All of this, the, tumor, the tumors were growing fast, he, he, he was limited mobility, and his speech was really soft and limited. And she said, he invited, they invited them, uh, husband and wife, and the husband had the tumors, uh, but also they invited their son and grandson. And in that invitation, when they were together, the son mentioned, yeah, I'm new in the faith. I'm new in the faith. And the woman just looked, and she had known the years of prayer for this particular son. And she ends up pulling uh, the gentleman with the tumors to, to the side and saying, oh my goodness, did you hear that? How are you feeling about all of that? And his words just whispered to this woman in our church was worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. In the God is wonderful faith, God reveals his power by giving us deliverance, and we love that, and I'm here for that all day, every day. But in the God is worth it faith, you show off God's worth through your unfaltering joy in the midst of suffering. And he's worth it. He is worth it. Over time, I've come to find out sometimes God is most glorified when sick people get well, and sometimes he is most glorified when sick people suffer well. And that's hard. That's hard, and I think that's what we see here a little bit playing out in Hebrews chapter 11. Again, verse 39 says, these were all commended for their faith. It wasn't one group over another. Group one, group two, both groups were commended because both groups showed their faith pleases God. Second point here, which the back half of verse 39 says, yet none of them in the NIV received what had been promised. Which is this little puzzling here because if you look earlier in the chapter in verse 33, it literally says that group one, they, they gained what was promised, right? But then just a few verses later, verse 39 in Hebrews 11, I hope you're following along in your Bibles, says, but none of them actually received what had been promised. But some did, it's like, wait, what in the world's going on, right? Noah was delivered through the ark. Joshua, by the power of God, knocked down the walls of Jericho. Abraham got the promised land. But what if the promise in verse 39 was not a promise of temporary relief from pain or a temporary manifestation of power, but it was something far greater. It was a greater promise that verse 39 is pointing to and looking ahead to. Did you know, have you thought about this this week in my study? I was really thinking about this. All of Jesus' miracles were temporary here on this earth in some way, fashion, or form that we see, the, the healing miracles, I should say. They were all temporary, right? Lazarus, dead four days. Jesus, come forth, Naz Lazarus. Let's change his name. Come forth, Lazarus. He comes forth, he's, he's alive. As far as we know, Lazarus died again. Sometime later. 
And he went probably, I would assume, back into that same tomb that Jesus called him out of, his friend Lazarus. Those who were healed of blindness, beautiful, amazing, powerful by Jesus. They died sometime and their physical eyes were no longer operating, just like at some point all of ours will not be. The lame who were all of a sudden now able to walk, praise God, they too died sometime. And as far as I know, dead people aren't walking. It's probably a good thing, right? But all of these miracles were temporary miracles. The object of their faith was never meant to be it of a temporary miracle. All of these temporary manifestations of power served a far greater purpose, which was to point to the fact that God was coming to earth to take on the penalty of sin and the curse of death onto himself so that we could be saved through this resurrection. It's the, it's the greater miracle. It's the greater promise. God's purpose has always been to point people to that purpose, which is the greater purpose. Hear me out, the, the point of faith is not to make our life easier. It's not. The point of faith is not so that we treat Jesus like a genie, our personal genie, and we get everything we want and everything we've envisioned for our life goes exactly the way in which we had hoped it would. It's not to live our best life now, right? The point of faith is pointing people to the power and worth of God that is revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that in every season of life, whether in prosperity or poverty, whether in joy or despair, whether in sickness or in health, the greater purpose in every circumstance in my life would be to ask, how can this season of life glorify God? And how can I or my family and those around me in this season of despair, how can in this season we point people to Jesus? Whether it's on the miracle or on the mountaintop of a miracle, which I'm all in for that, or in the valley of what feels like the shadow of death, where there's pain and despair and hurt. We gonna be in for that? None of them received what had been promised. Group one, group two, they're all still awaiting that greater promise that is in Christ, Jesus. This invitation to live a life of faith is an invitation to join with these great men and women in a larger story, the story of Jesus. It's a story in which we all play a role in, whether it's to shine or to suffer. It's always to bring glory to Jesus and play the hand that we've been dealt in order so that others may know him more. So what are you going through right now? What are you going through? What miracle have you been praying for? Some of you I know a long time, 10, 20, 30, 40 plus years, some of you. What trouble, what difficulty, what is the, what is the pain level and the depths of your soul right now? Some of you, perhaps you have quit praying for the miracle. You've given up some time ago. It's an impossibility. Think of those questions. How can I glorify God in the midst of this? So let me just give a possibility. So you might be in the area where it's like, well, I've been praying for a son or a daughter or a loved one or a grandson or a granddaughter. It's just, there's no movement there. They seem further away from Jesus than when I first started praying with them. Doesn't make any sense. Well, what if in that season, you're able to meet with others who too have been praying for sons and daughters and grandchildren to come to know Jesus and 
God sends you as someone who, who knows that pain, who feels that despair, and you meet with them and pray with them and you gather together, going in the fire together. I want to look at Hebrews 12 as we come to our final point. Hebrews 12, so literally right after what our sister Danielle just read, you get to this chapter break, and you could argue it's maybe not a great chapter break, or maybe it is, whatever. But here's what Hebrews 12 goes on to continue. Therefore, therefore, what's the therefore, therefore? Everything that was just shared in Hebrews 10 and 11. Therefore, since we are surrounded by all of these amazing men and women of faith, great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us in the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Do you know there's been a race marked out for you? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Think of Golgotha. And then before that, think of Gethsemane where Jesus is on his knees, the Bible shares, dropping or sweating great droplets of blood. And in Gethsemane, he prays while a few of his best friends are just sleeping and snoozing when he asks them to pray with him for even an hour. And, he, and he's praying and he prays, God, let this cup pass before me. But nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. And the answer to the Son of God in the most deep despair and anguish imaginable to that first request, let this cup pass before me, the answer was no. No. And his resolve, as we know, is connected to the prayer, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So the author here is pointing us to this Jesus. For the joy set before him, what allowed him to get to the end, the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now consider him who endured such oppositions from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The baton is in our hands now. It's in our hands. I'm, I'm doing this study, and I'm a, I'm a part of this study in the senior adult group called The Overcomers. It's Matt Chan. It is such a good study. We just started, and we're, I'm three chapters into this book, and one of the points he makes within the first few chapters is, listen, Moses had his time, right? Sarah had her time. Rahab had her time. But now listen to me. You read through Revelation. Our time is today. Our time is now. This is our time. And now the baton is in our hands. I may have shared this story before. I'll, I'll try to share it quickly. But uh, William Borden was born right after the turn of the 20th century, and he had a life of luxury and power laid out for him. At the time, the Borden Melt Company was one of America's largest, most successful companies in its day. And William's parents were cultural Christians, Sounds like, but as a teenager, William had an, had an experience with Jesus, gave his life to the Lord. And 
Uh, when he graduated high school, he took a gap year to travel around the world, and on that trip, he became overwhelmed at the vast number of people around the world who had never even heard of the name of Jesus. And he came home and told his parents he believed that God was calling him to bring the gospel to Muslims, particularly the large Muslim population in the western part of China at his time. And his parents objected and insisted that he take over the family business instead, so they sent him to Yale, and he, he was humble, and he went to Yale, graduated with high honors, and after that, he was sent to graduate school at Princeton and graduated with high honors from there too, but still this calling for William would not go away. He gave away the vast majority of his wealth, of his inheritance, and at the age of 24, he walked away from his inheritance entirely and set sail for Cairo, where he planned to study Arabic for a year and then head to China, where he planned to spend the rest of his life ministering to those who have potentially never heard the name of Jesus. As his ship pulled up to the shoreline of Egypt and he saw all of the mosques, he, he had dreamed of a day that those mosques would one day, one day be steeples with worshipers of Jesus filling them. However, upon arriving in Cairo, the story is told, he contracted spinal meningitis. And people in America all over here in North America were praying for William. They had heard the story. Um, but he ended up dying just four months into that after arriving to Egypt. And at 25, he, his faith had become his sight. And someone asked him in those final moments before he died what he thought about his decisions now, given how things had turned out, and his biographer famously summarized his answer into six words, no reserves, no retreats, no regrets. No reserves, no retreats, no regrets. Now on William Borden's tombstone that you can still see today is this, this quote, apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. Apart from faith in Christ, there's no explanation for such a life. Friends, the baton is in our hands now. How are we doing? How, how are we doing? And, and God may not be calling you overseas. In fact, he's, he's probably not, but he's definitely calling you over here. Might not be overseas, but it's over here. And when you have a baton in your hand, as far as I know, it's not really time to goof around, right? It's, it's not really time to be like, okay, I got the baton. That's kind of cold out, right? It's kind of, it's a little windy today for a run. What was I thinking, right? It's really, those thoughts might come. Never been a runner, bet you can't tell. Uh, never been a runner. <laughs> but you don't get this thing in your hands and just start thinking, you know, now's a good time to have a cup of coffee or a good time to just complain about all the world's problems and how my life is just, ah, uh, and all the laundry and all the, uh, right? All of these things that I know I can complain about. It's not the time. When you have a baton in your hands, you have a race to run and you have a race to finish. And friends, church, now the baton has been placed in our hands for such a time as this. And some of you know this, and this is a beautiful thing. Some of you have made it 70, 80 plus years. You especially know you're in the last leg of your race. And you are in the process of running and finishing well and handing this thing off. And I was told by a guy who was in my office and I was sharing, I had a baton on there so on my desk and I felt like I kind of have to explain this because this dude's like, what is happening? What's this pipe in my pastor's office for? And so 
I was like, hey, this is for a sermon illustration. I go, it's actually a baton. And, and he goes, you know what? That's interesting you have that. He goes, I've learned that the passing of the baton is as important as running. Because we lost an Olympic medal some time ago, he was sharing, because of the pass, and they fumbled it. And I was like, oh, that'll preach, right? How are we passing the baton on? Some of us, listen to me, if your children and grandchildren are lapping you in the faith, what's wrong with us? What's wrong with us? We need to be running with them. We need to be running with them, ready, eager, excited to pass the baton to them. That's the Christian life. Run with conviction. Run to the very end. You're probably tired. You should be. So should I. Good. But when we gave our lives to Jesus, we signed up to be wore out and wrung out for the glory of God. That's what we all signed up for when we gave our lives to Jesus. To be wore out and wrung out for the glory of God. And so if we're not running, or if we're getting entangled in sin, as the author of Hebrews here in chapter 12 shares, it's just tangling us up, same thing, 30 years, 40 years, 20 years, 10 years, same thing. What do we do? We have the Holy Spirit of God living within us. We're sealed with the spirit of promise. What are we getting entangled up in every Every year, move forward. Let's run. Let's entangle from the crap and let's run the race that he has set out for us. It's no time to be arguing church politics and everything else. Forget it. Let's run the race. Let's get in gear. We have a race to finish. We have a race to complete, and we have a baton to pass to the next generation. And what are we going to pass them? Let's continue in this thought as we pray and we prepare our hearts to receive communion. Father, oh, Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your kindness. You're far more kind than me, far more gracious than any of us, far more merciful. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your grace. Father, we, we don't want to be entangled in the same junk, in the same sin that just besets us. It just slows us down. The ankle weights of this world, it just seemed to slow us down in the race that you have set us on. And so, Father, I, I, just, I just want us to take a moment to just confess anything in our heart that is slowing us down, that is entangling us. As we seek to run this race, whether young or old or somewhere in between, some people are looking to pass the baton to the next generation and they've just, they've said no right now. They've just taken a break. It's not time for that. So God, I just, I just pray that our hearts right now would just be full of repentance in any area that we need to repent from, that we need to turn from and give to you. We need to see your spirit, your power move in our lives in a miraculous way. So Father, we take a moment to confess anything and everything that might be hindering us. We don't want to play games. 
Father, we love you. We thank you for this time that we get to have together as the body of Christ. The bread, which represents your body, which was laid down for us, and the cup, which represents your blood that was spilled for us in the new covenant that you ushered in, Jesus. We, we want you to allow us to experience something special and don't let us miss it in this moment. I think so often we just miss it. We don't wanna miss it today. So Father, would you have us experience your presence in a special way through the breaking of the bread and the taking of the cup and doing that together as a people. Help unite us as your people and help encourage us in the areas where we need encouragement. Give us power in the areas where we need power. It's all for your holy name we pray. Amen.